great event, Amsterdam, perfect city. Hello, everyone. <coughs> um, as Mark said, this morning, um, Ian and I are going to be talking about the subject of wrestling radio, which is talking about low power, wide area networking, and the radio technologies that you could choose for this, the problems you'll encounter. Um, the session, as uh, Mark said, is split into two parts. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the sort of the reality of cellular networking and in particular things like roaming and roaming data, roaming services between countries. And Ian's then going to deal with a much more technical subject of things like antennas and module choices and that kind of thing. So it's going to work out like that. Um, please, if there are questions as we go interactively, stick them through on Slido and we'll deal with those as we go, and hopefully I'll spot them, we'll deal with those. But also we'll try and find up some time to make the session interactive, so if people have got questions, we'll try and answer them as we go, and also perhaps do something at the end as well. Um, so Philip touched on the subject of uh, the, the, um, the gap, really, between prototyping things for IoT and actually doing this for real. And I'm as guilty as anyone else of falling into this uh, fallacy, I suppose. I obviously don't get a huge amount of time to do real engineering anymore. Nobody lets me, which is a good thing. My team don't like me getting too close to either hardware or software anymore. But for instance, this is a great example of something that was sitting on my desk at home before I came out here. Really easy these days to get together a bunch of kit, which you can just buy off the internet. So this is a Raspberry Pi, we've got a radio here, hanging off a massive battery pack with an enormous antenna, and think, as an engineer, I can show my boss that I can get data from a sensor and I can get it sent somewhere. Really easy, totally possible to do, as long as you ignore every one of the things you, don't have, you, you really do have to think about practically when you're building something for real. You're not really gonna have a battery that big. That antenna's not realistic. That device uses far too much power, it's got far too many capabilities, physically it's the wrong size and it will cost a fortune if you did it for real. So all those things that you can do as an engineer and hack it up and show people fall by the wayside when you start to think about doing it at scale and doing it for real. There is a massive gap and in a sense, while it's great that you can do those prototypes today, it's almost too easy because it sets a false expectation that this is something you can then stick into production three months later because you've, done a, you've demonstrated you've got some bits from one place to another. It's really not that simple, and we see time and time again projects that start like this. Everyone gets very enthusiastic about it, as I do myself, and then my engineering team say, yeah, but how about the 10 things you haven't thought about? And as Philip said, that's just the first part of it, the kind of the device side that we haven't even touched on all of the other problems that come across when thinking about doing this, because uh, communicating data isn't just about getting bits from A to B. There are a whole load of things you have to consider that are really almost a feedback, depending on what protocols you use, the life cycle of the device. All of those things inform things like the processor you need, how much memory you need, which in turn has an impact on the battery life, the battery capacity. There's a big feedback loop between many of the choices you make in certain areas and how your product ends up looking. <clears throat> and because of that area of complexity, and I'm really only talking on the stuff on the far left, the device, the software, the protocol, and the network, the complexity is such that it's really hard for many organizations to know where to start, to know what to, the first problems are to solve. And engineers tend to get stuck on things like, well, what processor do I need? I'll pick a, you know, whatever, STM32, or I want to pick a dot, 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 and that's where they focus their attention. Rather than stepping back from those considerations and thinking more about the use case, where's this thing going to go in the real world? How, what's the life cycle of the device going to really look like? And that's the place where we would suggest people start their consideration. Don't worry too much about the hardware. You'll be able to fill in those blanks later on, but think, start from a point of thinking, Where's this thing going to go? Am I, really, am I building a device that's going to work in one location? Is it going to end up going all over the world? Is it going to move around from place to place? That's actually a really key consideration to inform almost everything else that you're going to decide to do. So think about that, and then think about what the life cycle of the thing's likely to do. How much data does it really need to send? I mean, today we're fortunate that there are networks, um, you know, LTE networks, that allow us to send vast amounts of data streaming in real time, but all of that comes with a cost. It comes with a cost of power, it comes with a financial cost. There are loads of impacts to doing those things. Just because you can do it, do you really need to do those things? 
And so the second part of this is to think about the life cycle. What data do you need to send? How often do you need to, to send it? Consider those two points first, and it gives you a good starter into how to design and build the rest of your system. So briefly touching, before we go on to some more detail in this, about the three types of wide area, uh, low power wide area networking you may have uh, heard of or may be able to use. Cellular, LoRa, and Sigfox. There are others, but these are the three major players in the area. Cellular is really the only solution available for something that's going to be truly global. And for many of our customers, certainly, we find people adopt cellular because they don't know where their devices are going to be, and they, they're not dealing with a project that's just in one city. It's something where, either at the point of manufacture, they, they know the devices are going to go anywhere in the world, or certainly anywhere within a region, say, in Europe or the US <coughs> or Asia. But also, um, they might move around. They may move from territory to territory, so they need to have something which is going to be ubiquitous. Obviously, there are other projects um, which are different, where you know exactly where things are going to go, and you can have different choices in those cases. One of the things about cellular is it can be complex, if you try and do this yourself, to navigate operator contracts. It's fine to say, if you're doing the project, for example, just in um, the Netherlands, you know, you can go to KPN, they can do your data plan, everything's great, you're going to be good for the Netherlands. The minute you move to a different country, things become more complicated. And realistically, it's not sensible for an organization to try, and unless you happen to be you know, a, a, a many tens of thousands of person company, to try and broker relationships directly with operators yourselves in all of these countries for all these territories. You end up with a nightmare of contracts, contract terms, all kinds of things. It just doesn't make any sense to try and do that. And that is one of the complexities of cellular. Equally, your choice of modems for working in cellular can be complicated. Um, Back, in the, in, uh, you know, back five years ago, it was relatively simple. 2G and 3G work pretty much everywhere in the world. You could pick a module that do, does those things and know you're good. Now with LTE, and particularly low power and um, uh, you know, IoT-focused LTE variants, that becomes a more complicated decision. And certainly today, if you want global modules that work everywhere, they're expensive. It's just a fact. Um, LoRa, fantastic technology for things like private networks in fixed areas. If you're doing a campus deployment or you're doing a smart city, it can be a great technology to use um, for those kind of areas. The challenge is it has, it can be complicated to roll out. You are basically in charge of your own infrastructure, or you need to find somebody who can help you out with rolling that stuff out. And obviously, it's not great for a global solution. It's not like you know that you're going to have ubiquitous coverage everywhere. You're not. There are operators who obviously operate nationwide networks, but even then, there are challenges with regards to roaming from network to network in different countries. And it's certainly not something you could say, well, I'm going to build a device here, ship it anywhere in the world, and know it will work. That's just not realistic at all. And finally, Sigfox. Well, Sigfox is what it is. I'm not going to say too much about it. It has its challenges. It's obviously limited in terms of data and what it can do and its directionality. And again, it's a limited solution in terms of uh, its coverage. It can be great in certain applications, um, but they are, I think, relatively few and far between. So focusing now on cellular, um, I wanted to just explain a few things about it, because I get asked about these things all the time, about the reality of the different generations of cellular and what falls into what and what you can and can't do. So if I go down these columns very briefly, starting off with 2G, 2G is a nice solution because it's simple. It was defined simply. There are a relatively small number of radio bands that it covers. Ian's going to talk in far more detail about this, so don't feel that you're going to miss out on this. I can promise you that there's going to be loads of detail behind this coming up later. Um, and it meant that modules ended up being very cheap. Uh, today, they, you can pick up 2G modules for a matter of a few dollars. Um, and 2G is a circuit switch service primarily. So it basically means that you're, you're using circuit switch connections for voice, SMS, and USSD. Those are the three principal services. And data is provided by GPRS, relatively low bandwidth. One of the challenges of 2G is while it was at one point ubiquitous around the world, obviously in some regions it's now being sunset, i.e. phased out, as the frequency is being reused for different services, primarily LTE. And in particular, that's a challenge in the, U in the US where there now really is only one nationwide 2G carrier, and also in places like Singapore where there is no 2G at all. However, in Europe, it's still expected that 2G is going to last for quite some significant time. I don't think, while there's been rumblings about people re, uh, you know, turning off 2G networks, none of the big carriers have really announced concrete plans to do that or have set specific dates to do it. So I think 2G in Europe certainly is going to be around for longer, probably, than 3G, actually. 
3G, obviously an interim uh, technology, um, again, uses circuit switch connections for voice, SMS, and USSD, and obviously has its own uh, uh, packet-based data services. Again, in some regions, 3G has been sunset, which is an interesting thing, and as I said, likely to be shut down in Europe before. Generally, when you buy 3G modules, they also have 2G fallback. The two services were designed to work together. It was always considered as an evolution as part of the standards. Moving on to LTE, and this is where it's important to get a bit of terminology right, and there are some very different variations of how these things are referred to. Um, so when I'm going to talk in this presentation and I talk about LTE, I really mean full fat LTE, i.e. LTE, CAT 1, 4, and 8. And these categories, just so you understand them, really refer to the bandwidth that's available. So essentially you can think of the numbers after the CAT as being multiples of a block of bandwidth. So CAT 4 typically is around about four times faster than CAT 1, and CAT 8 is eight times faster than CAT 1, roughly. Ian will tell you much more about the detail of that, but that's essentially the way to think about it. They all use the same technologies. as a, they, they may use more or less bandwidth to get that, but it's essentially the same technology, all of those different categories. Um, LTE is interesting because it doesn't provide any circuit switch services. Uh, everything's done using, using uh, da data. So voice over IP, SMS over IP, or real data services. Now, one of the things that people don't realize is that's what happens that when you're using your smartphone today and you send a text message. You may not notice this directly, but because that text message, not all these services are necessarily implemented in a network. So for example, while you can do SMS on IP, I don't know of an operator that's actually implemented that today. So when you send an SMS message on your smartphone, your smartphone very briefly switches back to a circuit switch connection, either 3G or 2G, to send the text message, then flips back to LTE. And you'll see that happen quite a lot. If you look at actually what's happening on your phone when you're using it, you'll see the indicator at the top of the phone indicating what network you've got, and you will bounce around between these carriers dynamically depending on what your phone's doing. So that's something to, uh, to, to be aware of. Um, <coughs> Because of the wide range of bands, as I mentioned in 2G and 3G, there are relatively small number of different frequency bands that are used for this. In LTE, I think the total possible number is something in the 80s. It's a huge number of different bands. These uh, coverage tends to be somewhat regional, and in fact, modules are also made for, for purposes of really price to be regional. So you'll find a module will be suitable for the European market or for North America or uh, Australasia, for example, or the Far East. Those modules are being, power, being basically cost-optimized to only cover certain of those bands. But fundamentally, the technology is the same in all the modules. But it does give a challenge now, because you now have to find a module that's suitable for the regions. And if you're going to ship products globally, that can be challenging. As I mentioned, you can get modules that are truly global, but you end up having to pay for them, and pay for them both in terms of, uh, well, you'll see in a minute what, what pay for them in terms of. LTE is often combined with 2G or 3G fallback for the reasons I just mentioned is what happens on your smartphone. Um, and that can be useful because, again, in areas where there is known LTE coverage but there is 3G or 2G, it'll fall back to using those. Now, in recent releases of the uh, 3GPP specifications, the 3GPP is the group that standardizes all of this, Various LTE variants were introduced to look after IoT applications or to promote, be promoted for IoT, IoT applications. And in particular, you'll see CAT M1, also known as CAT, CAT M1, CAT M, uh, and then also um, MBIoT. So these two technologies you'll have heard of, I'm sure, um, and they are LTE variants. Now, they're different in many ways, but the key things to take away from this is that CAT M1 is basically a variant of real LTE, real full-fat LTE. It uses a lot of the same infrastructure, and for operators, it's relatively easy to upgrade. You can upgrade software on base stations and use the rest of the infrastructure to support that. So it's a relatively easy fix to roll out, in a sense. Um, again, modules that you'll find that support um, CAT M will often also have 2G or 3G fallback, depending, and bo or both, depending on where, where they work, to give you a, a more comprehensive coverage. MBIoT is somewhat different in that it is not a strictly an LTE 
protocol. It doesn't use the same radio bearers, it doesn't use the same infrastructure. So to, for an operator to roll those out requires deployment of new infrastructure. It's not just a case of a software upgrade on a base station. So those, up, those in real terms, um, MBIoT upgrades are more complicated for operators to roll out. They have advantages. You have, uh, there's better power optimization, there's better range for, for devices, but they're, they're more complex to roll out in general. So the radio technologies that we've just talked about, however, are not necessarily, the, when you're thinking about a device, the only factors to consider. One of them is physical size. This is actually a real comparison of two modules, two SIMCOM modules, for example, that just give a side-by-side -side example of what these things look like. So this is a 2G module on the left-hand side, 2G only. I think in reality that's 17 mil, I think it is, across, and compared size by size with a 7600G, which is a global LTE 2G, 3G modem. Now, for some people, that size difference is simply rules out the use of these modules full stop. We have customers, for instance, who make, um, for example, a cat tracking product. It's a cat collar that go goes around a cat and allows them to track owners to track where their cats have gone. In that kind of size, you physically can't fit that module in. I mean, it's big, it's, it's, you know, it's a big chunky thing. There's no way you could use that in that application. And that actually poses a challenge of how you build these things when you, you physically can't fit the thing in the device. So that's a, certainly one of the constraints to consider. Then coverage is obviously a major factor. When thinking about the module selection, and indeed other parts of selection, selections of antennas, for example, what modules you're going to, uh, what, what your choices are going to determine where your products need to be or where the products can be. And that's what I said right at the beginning. Where these things are going to operate, the markets you want to sell products into is one of the key factors from an engineering standpoint to consider right up front. You need to know where they're going to be so you can make an accurate choice in this area. And coverage is not just about is there a network in the country, but also if I'm going to get any kind of service or connectivity service from a, from a provider, Where's that going to work? How many countries is it going to be in? In a given country, am I just working with one operator or are there multiple operators in that country? Again, it's really important. We all know a case where you're using your own phone in your home market. You don't have coverage, but your friend who's on a different network does have coverage because not all net network operators are equal. They do have different coverages in different places. So ideally, particularly in a roaming environment, you want to have a situation where you have more than one operator that you can roam to to give you the best coverage because not only is that better because you ha you're connected more of the time, but you really want a situation where you can pick the best coverage at any given point because it saves you battery life. If you have coverage where you're flipping from operator to operator frequently based on th the highest signal strength, for example, over the lifetime of a device, you can save around about 20% of the total battery use for the, air for the radio over a period of use just because you're always going to the closest operator with the best signal, rather than having to drive up the power amps in the front end of the radio to get to a signal from a carrier that you're locked into because you didn't have a choice. Um, obviously, power, is an power and optimization for power is a critical concern when you're thinking about these things, partly because of what I just mentioned, but in a general system sense, optimizing for power, particularly in battery-powered applications, is something that's really important. And that comes partly down then to software complexity. If you're going to have to deal with all of these modems, different bearers, different AT command sets, for example, whether you're on circuit switched or packet switched connections at any given time, you have to consider how you're going to manage all that stuff in software to make that seamless for yourself. Now, I think one of the things that is not well known by people is how interoperator roaming actually works. And um, I'm, I thought I'd just explain a little bit about this because Something that we get asked a lot is about, um, you know, does your product work here? Does your, do you offer service here? How does that work? Well, operators have two real sides to their business, and I know there are some operators here, so I hope I'm not going to offend anyone by telling, shedding a bit of light on people's operations. Um, <coughs> the, in general, there's two parts of an operator business. There's a, a, a part that's focused on selling products to consumers and to businesses, and then there's a whole separate group that's a wholesale group that are selling wholesale services, usually in between operators. They sell to each other. They're very different types of organizations. Um, and the wholesale uh, groups are the people responsible really for putting in place roaming agreements between carriers, which is what allows everyone to move around the world seamlessly with their smartphones and get coverage. But it's also what empowers IoT applications to work in the way they do. 
And the way that works is quite important because it explains a lot about what the reality of building IoT and choosing technologies today, where that comes from and where there are constraints and, and blockages, if you like. <coughs> So the GSM Alliance has a, a working group called the Wholesale um, Agreements and Services Group that meets twice a year. This is the next one, actually in Valencia, um, hosted by Telefonica. They're done twice a year. I can't remember. The, I think the last one was in Kuala Lumpur, actually. They're done roughly every six months. And essentially, all the operators go there and barter roaming services. And they're talking about uh, defining what services they want to sell, buy and sell from each other, how much those services are going to cost, and to sign those agreements between different parties, it's simply. And most of these agreements today cover voice, SMS, GPRS and LTE data, and then signaling. So those are the kind of things that people are selling. And to that extent, there are even effectively boilerplate agreements that set out the details about these services, and it's pretty much a case of fill in, if I'm operator A, you're operator B, I say I'm going to have this much data that I want to buy from you, for example, or this much voice from you, you're going to do the same thing back, and we agree some prices and some volumes, job done, agreement signed. And there's almost boilerplate for doing those kind of agreements. And that's really how that works. That's how roaming agreements get put in place, simplistically. Now, the challenge really comes from that comment here about what these agreements today cover. These services. When you start thinking about LTE IoT networks, CAT-M and MB-IoT, we see lots of customers who've heard stories about this stuff and how great they are, and the fact that modules are super cheap and super small, that um, you know, a carrier, you can insert the name here, has said, yeah, this stuff is available. And that's great if you know where your product's going to be. So if I, for example, wanted to, to put together uh, a service using either of these technologies, for example, and I wanted something to work in Berlin, no problem. I can get a T-Mobile, somebody will fix that. If I want, say, one of these services in Spain, I can go to perhaps Telefonica. And in Madrid, no problem. The problem comes when somebody says, I want this, and I want it to work anywhere in the world. OK, that becomes a problem. So the reality is today, and this is as of September 19, from the GSM Alliance, so you, that's probably going to be an optimistic picture rather than a pessimistic one of the reality. There are 24 countries that have got commercial deployments of CAT-M today. That's the list. And there are some very big things missing from that list, obviously. 24 countries out of, for example, the 190 that we support in ThingStream, that's a big difference for doing this for real. But there is some good news in here. Places like the US are in here, which obviously has an issue with 3G. So the fact that that's on that list is great. And actually, patching between the overlap between 2G and the countries covered by CAT-M is pretty good actually, if you think about it, you're almost, if you could think about the places that have 2G deployed and the places that have CAT-M1, that's a pretty much almost global coverage. It's pretty good. You'll notice there's nowhere, for instance, in Africa that's covered in, in any of these lists, uh, certainly on CAT-M1. Now, MBI2 IoT looks more promising. 45 countries, again, most of Europe's in here, which is great. But one of the challenges comes back to what I said. Um, it's the elephant in the room, is all about roaming. Cat M1 today falls underneath the roaming agreement for LTE data. It's an LTE based technology. So the interoperator agreements that exist for, for dealing with uh, LTE, full fat LTE, also cover Cat M1. It's covered by that stuff. MBIoT does not cover that. And as of today, there are no interoperator roaming agreements in place for MBIoT. And also, there's not a mechanism defined. To the, it's not like that boilerplate that I mentioned, where you can simply get the boilerplates, sign up the deals, you're done. That doesn't exist either, because MBIoT isn't a strictly LTE technology. So at the moment, Cat M1 is more likely to be a service that can roam. And in fact, we see that already today. We have, we have customers and partners who already are testing uh, CAT-M1 in areas where there is no coverage for other things. And it works fine with the, under the existing LTE agreements. MBIoT, there are places where it's being tested and have demonstrated that signaling works. So there's two parts to doing a bit roaming. Technically, it has to be an interconnection between, the two, between two operators such that the signaling works and allows your SIM card from one operator to roam into a second operator. But then the commercial side of that is a completely different subject. And it's the commercial agreements that ultimately, at the moment, for MBIoT are way behind. 
And the challenge for that is there's very little impetus to create those agreements. Those wholesale groups I mentioned before are obviously driven by price volume of the services that they're selling and buying. That's what they're incentivized to do. And the challenge in this is that for the typical MBIoT application, the cost of for an operator to generate a CDR, call data record, to pass to a second operator is higher than the amount of revenue they'll generate from actually billing for that device. So there's very little impetus to get those things done. LTE is fine because it's covered by the existing LTE agreement. MBIoT, really challenging just for this reason. It's a commercial fact of life that these, there is not enough devices and the volume is not sufficiently high to make this a priority for anyone to fix. So, as a bit of a recommendation and conclusion from all of that, today it's perfectly possible to build and choose and select modules that work globally. You can pick 2G, 3G, CAT, M, CAT 1, that's full fat LTE modules for, for picking a completely global solution. They'll work well, they may be expensive, but they will work everywhere. So there are solutions to building things globally, but you just have to accept that the reality is you want to have a product that's truly global and guaranteed to work, it's physically going to have a big module size and it's going to be expensive as a module. Now, there are ways to, uh, to deal with that, of course. Just because the module costs, say, $40 rather than $10 for a, a 2G modem, for instance, you can obviously think about other ways of changing that capex into an opex cost. So you actually hide the cost of that $30 over the lifetime of the device. Most people's IoT devices you know, are expecting to go into the market for five years. So rather than thinking about that cost up front, there are ways and means of trying to think about that and spread out that cost over the life, over life cycle of the device. And that's what I would recommend for these kind of problems where you're trying to hit a bill of materials cost. Just, again, to that point at the beginning, don't just focus on the bill of materials, the engineering problem, but think about the lifespan of the device. Where is it going? What's it going to happen? What lifespan are you dealing with here? It's not just something that's going to be used for 12 months and then binned, probably. I mean, there are some applications like that, but it's unusual. If you're doing things where you just want the US and Europe, it's an easier story. You can actually today now use the 2G LTE CAT1 modules um, if you want to be totally safe. So this is 2G. Cat 1, full fat Cat 1 modules. They're relatively inexpensive, they're relatively small, and they're guaranteed to work. They'll give you coverage across these markets without any problems, and other markets too, actually. In fact, I think um, the combination of Cat M1 and 2G for ThingStream is a great story. You're going to be finding yourself in 180 plus countries, I think, in the combination of those two. Um, if you want to, and if your deployment is probably greater than six months into the future for commercial deployment, not for testing, for testing you can do that now. Using 2G and CAT M1 modules is a realistic choice. There's, there are enough of these agreements because they're commercially backed by the LTE interoperator agreements that you can start to ch choose those, those modules for these type of the, the deployments. You're safe knowing that CAT M1 commercially is going to be a not a blocker. Because the most frustrating thing is finding that, that technically it works, but commercially it's blocked with a 2G fallback. So as long as you're doing that and module size and, uh, size and cost is critical, they're a good choice. And there are obviously a number of vendors around who provide those kind of modules that fit into these. But try and make sure you have 2G fallback on the module. Don't just pick an NB-IoT module. Chances are, unless you know exactly where that's going to go, that's not going to be the right decision. Um, so I'm just going to answer a couple of questions that have come up here. Can you comment on 5G? Yes, 5G is a kind of umbrella standard that covers a number of things. Obviously, it covers the things that everyone, everyone talks about, which is the higher bandwidth, lower latency stuff, um, which is um, great for some applications. But more importantly, it's a kind of an umbrella standard that covers all the 4G technologies as well. So all the 4G, all the LTE stuff, rolls up into the 5G, 5G standards. So 5G isn't just a thing. It's an umbrella of a number of things. I think Ian might talk a bit more about this. The important point about that is it is expected that the, um, the roaming agreements for 5G will cover all of those services. And the good news about that is that is the point at which things like MBIoT will be covered by proper roaming agreements because there'll be an incentive based on everything else, including the, the higher data, higher volume consumer services, to pull that into the same umbrella agreement. Should we avoid using MBIoT then? Well, that's a good question. Uh, if it was me, yes, I would for all the reasons I've mentioned. I wouldn't think, today I don't think it's a commercially safe decision to choose that as the only standard to go with. I would think it's more comfortable from what I've seen and from the tests that we've certainly done 
unless you know exactly where it's going to be. If you do, and you only to do in one country, and you know the ca a carrier can support you, you're probably good to do that. But if you don't know those things, you have no control over where your products go, I think it's a risky choice. Um, what do I think about the hype around 5G? As I say, it's an umbrella standard. Everyone in the industry is always looking for the fastest, quickest thing. You know, it's, and it's nice to see. You see the demos, it's really impressive. But for, for most IoT applications, I don't think it's particularly relevant at the moment. You know, there, there's still a lot of other problems to sort out. Why not other countries don't have Cat M1 and MBIoT? Uh, I think, well, that's a good question. Does that mean why are there not more countries that have Cat M and MBIoT? I think that's what that question is asking. And the answer is because, again, it comes down to the imperative to roll things out. One of the promises of these, these, these LTE variant networks is that they'll be cheap. Well, cheap means that nobody's going to make any money of it, out of it. So therefore, the investment in those things is not necessarily prioritized because, yes, they're, sure, there may be a number of devices out in the market, but analysts have, have predicted volumes for both these type of technologies for some time and have been way wide of the mark. In fact, the only place they have traction at the moment is China. So, and that's because the reality is the networks aren't there, the networks aren't there because the devices aren't there, the devices aren't there because the cost model doesn't really stack up. You know, at the end of the day, operators are commercial organizations quite reasonably, and they choose to deploy things where they can make money. And therefore, the deployment of 5G for consumers, for instance, so you can watch more YouTube videos more quickly, is a way high pro higher priority commercially than dealing with small bandwidth more, uh, you know, IoT applications where nobody makes very much money out of them. Very good. Thank you very much. I'm now going to hand over to Ian, who's going to give you a much more in-depth conversation about some of these topics. Thank you, Bruce, and good morning, everyone. My name's Ian Greenshields. I'm, a, I'm an RF specialist, oh my God. It always scares me when I get introduced as being an RF specialist, because as soon as the word RF comes out, uh, I sort of see eyes glaze over, and then someone mentions deep technical detail, and a few more eyes glaze over. Or maybe it's time to catch up on a couple of emails. Uh, yes, I'm an RF specialist. I work uh, with uh, EBV, Electronic, uh, and I try to make RF easy. RF is actually not that complicated. We, 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 we like to give the impression that it's complicated. It's good job security. But RF is actually fairly easy. And what I want to do, um, I, I, I will look more at the RF side of it, um, but following on from what Bruce has said is just to take a look at where we are in technology and technology development. Uh, we've, uh, IoT, we've been talking about this word IoT for a few years now, haven't we? Five, ten years. Uh, and we're all sort of saying, right, when are we going to get all this big takeoff? When are we going to get all these devices being connected? I suppose I have the advantage of having been in the industry for a while. I've seen a similar thing with other technologies. So you start to see some of the signs and some of the trigger points that makes the technology take off. Um, I would, how many people have a smartphone with them now? I should, I should really have asked the question is who doesn't? Uh, how many people use Bluetooth on their smartphone? So everyone even, you say, you know what Bluetooth is, and you understand it. Bluetooth has been around for about 20 years. Uh, I think it's really only in the last 10 years that Bluetooth has really become ubiquitous, that everyone knows what it is, everyone has it in their pocket, and everyone uses it. Uh, as an example of how sometimes it takes a while for technology, Bluetooth 15 years ago was something that you paid extra for on a high-end phone, and then you bought this little earpiece headset whatever, and you say, hey, this is great. I can make phone calls while I'm driving now. Fantastic, yeah, wonderful. So you're driving down the motorway with your phone. Ah, I need to pair my Bluetooth. Oh, sorry, hang on a minute. Uh, yeah, press the power button for three seconds till the blue light flashes into the pin on your phone. You've crossed three lanes by now. It was a real pain to connect Bluetooth to the headset and this is a technology that was designed to make driving safer. Sometimes it takes a while to get it right. Now, you put the phone in the car, when it rings, you expect it to come over the speaker. I don't even think about it. With IoT, we've gone through these similar scenarios. Is how do we make 
Let's use a slide. Yes, we do have some slides. How, how, do, how do we make IoT parts connect? What we want, IoT is a, is a marketing word, isn't it? To me, IoT, it's a, it's a sensor or it's an actuator, and we want it to connect to something. I'm an RF engineer. I said RF is simple. How do I get my sensor or my actuator to talk to something that I can control it with. And we've used this, uh, we, we use the, the, the cellular network has been in our lives now for 30 years, hasn't it? We started off, we start, we started off with GPRS, we've made the transition. Uh, I want more data. I want, to stream, I want to stream YouTube, I want Netflix. My kids want to do it in the same car. Give me more data, give me more mobility. Oh, by the way, I want battery life as well. How, how long does your smartphone battery last these days? A day, if you're lucky. How long did your, uh, how long did your what, what do we used to call it? Your Nokia 2210 or something. How long did the battery on that last 20 years ago? You, 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 charged it up, you charged it up at the weekend, took the phone with you for your week's travels and came back and charged it up the following weekend. We've forgotten about that. What happens is we want more data but we want lower power. Oh, and by the way, I don't pay for it anything either. So with the cellular standards evolution, we've had the drive to get more data, but it's really run at a, a, at a, a, at a, a cost of other things. Uh, so data rate, the cellular networks have been driving data rate up, mobility. Um, I came up from Paris yesterday on the high-speed train to Amsterdam. I want, it's, I, I want, I, I, I'm working, uh, some people were watching videos, I was working, <laughs> more fool me. I want it to work while the train's traveling at 300 kilometers an hour. It's, uh, we want mobility, we want the battery to last a long time, and it, we don't want it to cost too much. So we've had this, the cellular network has been, all the operators are trying to get this data rate, data rate, data rate. And if we just want a simple data connection, this has been somewhat contrary. The way the cellular networks have been going has not helped people like us who are just trying to get some simple connection. Yes, we want that mobility. We want it to work everywhere. Uh, we want it to be low cost. But do you know what? I don't need 100 meg plus of data. I'm not streaming video. I just want to send a few bytes of information. But we're being forced into the cellular networks by the operators who have paid billions of euros for the spectrum so that they can offer high-speed data. So we've got to try and square this circle of, yes, we want that global connectivity. Yes, we want it to be simple. Yes, we want it to be low cost. But by the way, we don't need quite so much data. What can we do about it? And from an RF perspective, uh, this is quite a significant transition. So, just following on from that, uh, there'll be a test on these numbers later, b before lunch. Uh, if we look at 4G and the evolution to 5G, it's all about data rate. Data rate in RF terms means frequency space, it means bandwidth. So, if I want a high data rate, I need wide bandwidth. So, how do uh, the operators do that? By spending a lot of money to buy exclusive bits of spectrum. And the problem that we've had over the last 20 years is these pieces of spectrum, they have been very exclusive. They've largely been occupied by the military who were not too keen to give it up, which is why they've had to pay a lot of money for it. So the cellular networks, are, have, uh, they, they, use a, they use a lot of different frequencies. They're not standard across the globe. There's some commonality across Europe. There's some commonality across the Americas. But for God's sake, don't try and read that. There's a huge number of different bands, different frequencies. So for global coverage, this is something of a problem because from the RF perspective, it makes it horrendously complicated. I don't want it to be complicated. I want it to be simple. If it's complicated, it's big, it's expensive, it consumes a lot of power. So on 4G, we've got to somehow align ourselves with having to cover a lot of different frequencies whilst not making it expensive. Uh, this is the bit I'm going to test you on after we've had the test on the frequency bands. If you, I, 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 pulled, this, um, I, 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 just, I pulled this off the internet. I was looking for, I wanted uh, someone to see the, uh, I wanted you to see what the RF front end looks like on your smartphone. What you've got in your smartphone is not dissimilar 
to what you see there. And it's horrendously complicated. I'm an RF engineer. I think that's horrendously complicated. Uh, you've got... Oh, wrong button. Oh, good. I love technology. How do I go backwards? There we go. There's my dot. Six different antennas. Why do you need lots of different antennas? Well, you've got different frequency bands. You might need, uh, you might need positioning. You've got, a, you've got a GPS or a GNSS antenna to receive the satellite. You've got, uh, you've got a Wi-Fi connection. You've got, remember Bluetooth? You've got a Bluetooth connection in there. They all need different antennas. And uh, inside the radio, inside the RF part, which is where, I've, where, where I spend my time, every single one of these different bands, every single one of these different antennas has to be connected to a radio. The simplest solution for me is one band, one antenna, one cheap radio. And the cellular networks have driven us completely away from that. So they, it, it does get extremely complicated. Now, the advantage if you're Apple or Samsung is that you're making 100 million phones a year, so you can squeeze the suppliers way, way down, squeeze them on, uh, they, they'll design their own chipsets, uh, so you can get that complexity down to a reasonable cost reasonable in inverted commas. I've noticed the iPhone prices seem to keep creeping up, but you can get it down to a consumer price level at least. But it's very, very complicated. And from an IoT perspective, we cannot do that. We cannot afford it. We can't afford it in terms of cost. We can't afford it in terms of complexity. We can't afford it in terms of size. And we don't need the main reason why all that complexity is in there, which is data rate. If we look at 2G, and Bruce, uh, uh, Bruce uh, mentioned this earlier, 2G has been around now for 30-odd years. Um, it's very, very simple. From an RF perspective, it's lovely. So I'm looking at the 2G global coverage, and I'm realizing it's not the same as, the <laughs> as Bruce's map. There are one or two little gaps in there I think we can, uh, we, 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 we can uh, discuss over where they are. But basically, 2G... Uh, it actually uses two bands. You have, uh, if you want to be pedantic, it's four bands, but you've got 850 and 900 megahertz and 1800 and 1900 megahertz. Uh, from my perspective, these are two bands because 850 and 900 megahertz are so close together, you use the same radio, it doesn't matter. Ditto with 1800 and 1900 megahertz. So this is very simple. Uh, that was the... Um, 17 by 15 millimeters, uh, Bruce. <laughs> you were asking earlier what the size was. This is a simple 2G modem that will work anywhere in the world. Almost anywhere in the world. Uh, and it will give 2G coverage. It's low cost. What do I mean by low cost? Five euros? Something like that. That's low cost. Not iPhone low cost, but low cost. This is a fairly simple solution. Um, uh, so, and two, and so 2G today is wonderful for IoT because it gives global coverage, it's very low power consumption, particularly when you use protocols like MQTT because the transmitter is hardly on. Uh, when, we're, when we're talking from an RF perspective, when we're talking about power consumption, what that actually means is how long do I need the transmitter to stay on for? Because that's when the, that's when the battery goes flat. Uh, your phone doesn't go flat if it's sitting in your pocket as fast as it does if you're on the phone talking or streaming video. It's when we're using, transmitting, receiving, that's what's drawing the current, and particularly on the transmit side. It's the, it's the transmit side that sucks the battery dry, basically. And 2G is, is, is very, it's very simple for that. And it's simple because it's mature. You know, we've made all the mistakes. They've been, they were solved 20 years ago. So it's a nice, simple solution. So how do we take this advantage uh, that we have with 2G and transition it to the new 4G, 5G networks? Uh, and the first thing I would say, well, <laughs> don't transition if you don't have to. Uh, the 2G networks still will remain around for quite a while. It's going to vary by region to region and country to country. Um, but we, we're still, Bruce mentioned uh, the uh, roaming agreements and network coverage. I think the simple reality is that a network operator is not going to switch off a 2G network until all their customers can switch seamlessly onto a 4G network. They might want to switch it off earlier because they want to use the spectrum for high data rates, but I think a lot of them will be around for quite a while. So again, looking, looking just at the radio, I'm up on a pedestal here, I can't see my own slides. Uh, 
I, I mentioned earlier what I like to see from an RF perspective. I want a nice simple radio. I want one band, one frequency. All right, two frequencies if you, if you must. But then I can just have, I can keep my RF simple. That means it's low cost, that means it's small, uh, and that means it's easy to design. I want decent battery life. Again, I need to keep it simple. Complexity uses current, uh, so I don't want it to be complex. Uh, how, how do we do that? From an RF perspective, uh, a simple radio, few bands. I, I don't want a network operator. They do, they do. I don't like it when network operators come and say, okay, so for this region, we need your radio to cover bands 1, 3, 7, 5, 9, 41, 40. Every time you add a band, you add complexity, you add cost, you add size, you add power consumption. So I want a simple radio, fewer bands, a single antenna. There's another, there's another thing which you will see a lot, uh, particularly with LTEs, we use, uh, we use a separate antenna, it's called a diversity antenna. And uh, what this does is it basically increases the signal strength, so it makes the, it makes the radio work better. If you, if you remember the days of an old FM radio, you know, if you moved the radio, if you were listening to a radio station that was a little bit crackly, if you moved it a meter to the left or a meter to the right, ah, signal's good there. If we move the antenna, this is just physics, but if we have two antennas and we say, which one's got the best signal, we can use that and it makes, it, it makes the radio better. This is called a diversity antenna. And it's good, it's nice to have, but hey, it adds complexity. So do we really need a diversity antenna? Low transmit power means low battery drain. So the lower the transmitter power, the more battery life I can save. But low transmitter power equals shorter range. Uh, so we, th th there's a compromise. Data rate is the big thing. Uh, if we can cut down on data rate in a cellular system, we can save an awful lot of power. The cellular systems were designed to maximize data rate. This is the compromise that we're working with. And we want simple modulation schemes. Uh, I won't go into great technical depth on modulation schemes. Suffice to say that a simple modulation scheme uh, is, more bandwidth, is more bandwidth efficient. It gives you longer range. Uh, not only does it make the RF simpler, it makes the signal processing in the baseband simpler as well. That means it doesn't consume so much power. So this, this is what we're really looking to, uh, to transition the 2G into, uh, into 4G. Bruce mentioned the different, uh, the, the different types of modulation schemes. I call it cat soup. Cat MB1, MB2, M1, cat 4, cat 12. What the heck? What the heck do all these mean? Actually, it just means data rate. We're talking about data rate. So the higher, the higher orders of modulation, uh, so like we have LTE, this is bandwidth. And again, bandwidth equals data rate. From an RF, perspe uh, from an RF perspective, the more spectrum you have, the greater uh, the data rate. So CAT1 is, uh, this is what you have today, fits in a 20 megahertz LTE channel. Uh, CAT4, CAT8, CAT12, CAT I think there's even CAT16 now. We're up to hundreds of megabits, uh, megabytes, sorry, of, da uh, of data rates. CAT-M is a, is a true LTE standard, as Bruce mentioned. It fits in with the other LTE standards and with the roaming agreements. And CAT-NB-IoT, also known as NB2 now, really, NB1, NB2. NB1 was released 13, NB2 is released 14. I guess we'll see another NB at some point. But they're backwards compatible, and for the, for, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. But it's narrow band. Uh, what's nice about it being narrow band is it makes it simple. It's back to this simple modulation scheme. Uh, narrow band, simple modulation scheme, that gives us greater coverage. If I go back a slide, if I make the, uh, if, if I make the radio simpler, simple modulation, the cell site automatically becomes larger without my having to increase the power or anything. So I automatically get better coverage. That's why we like simple modulation schemes and the narrow band modulation schemes. By the way, I do include CAT-M in that. Um, CAT-NB, NB-IoT and CAT-M tend to get used a little bit interchangeably. Um, and from an RF perspective, that's fine because the modems usually support both of them. So NB-IoT does have an issue on roaming. Uh, I, I guess it'll get solved at some point, but I'm not, I'm not close enough to know how. CAT-M definitely roams well. But from a modem perspective, they're usually pretty much covered, uh, the modems will cover both, so you've, you, you, you can take your pick. Uh, so 
By using the CAT-M modulation schemes and the CAT-MDIOT modulation schemes, we've achieved that goal of improving the coverage, making the baseband processing simpler, and reducing the cost. The trade-off, the molehill in the garden, if you like, is that we get much lower data rate. But hey, that's what we wanted. We didn't want those megabytes of data rate. So now we can use the cellular networks and have the advantage of that global coverage, but without having to pay for it in terms of complexity of the, uh, of the devices. So keep the number of bands, RF bands, as, uh, uh, as few as possible, because that reduces the RF hardware cost. Baseband bandwidth is lower signal processing cost. Single receive path, if you don't need a diversity antenna, you might lose a bit of signal strength, but you've got a narrower bandwidth, which will more than compensate for it. You reduce the RF complexity, you reduce the RF hardware costs. Lower transmit power saves you battery life. It also saves you cost as well, because you don't need a power amplifier in the transmitter stage. If you can get the power down to what comes out of a CMOS IC, you've just saved a whole lot of complexity in the RF. That's, why the, uh, uh, that's, what, we, that's what we mean by these power classes. Plus 20 dBm is 100 milliwatts. Uh, I'm probably staring into several hundred watts of lighting up here. So we're talking really very, very low power. Uh, you know, even, even, even a little LED in a, in, in a torch is not generating significantly less power than a low power radio is doing these days. We're talking low power. So what, what sort of solutions are available? Uh, Bruce showed some, uh, no, I do want to see my own slide. Bruce uh, sh showed some examples of some, uh, of, of some various modulation uh, of modules. Uh, and again, it's that compromise. It's the compromise that I mentioned earlier. Well, what do we want? If I want a practical solution, I care about the data rate, lower the better, but then power consumption, mobility, where do I want it to work? Mobility is two things. Do I want it to work at 300 kilometers an hour or do I want it to work in every single country I'm uh, traveling through? You've got two aspects of the mobility equation there. And where's the coverage and do I need fallback? Uh, it's the you know, fallback to 2G, 3G. That works for IoT. It doesn't work very well when you're streaming Netflix. My kids demand that we drive certain ways on holiday because that road doesn't have 4G coverage. Uh, there, 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 there are different aspects to mobility, but that's really what it means. And from a, this is more from a regulatory point of view, but we've got all these bands. How do we, how do we simplify it so that we don't need... 15 bands to get global coverage. At the, at the ITU, this, uh, the, this mess down here, there is some work going on. I, I, do, I, I sit on one of the ITU groups, and there is some work going on to try and have a few common bands for IoT. And traditionally, these are the low-frequency bands because this gives us the greatest range. Uh, so bands, uh, bands 5, 8, and 20, or in old money, that's, uh, that these are the bands around 7, 8, 900 megahertz, uh, which give uh, which give good range, good coverage, and there is some focus to try and channel uh, the IoT traffic down onto those bands. And from an RF hardware point of view, that's wonderful because it's going to make things simple. Uh, and at the end of the day, it's simplicity that's going to uh, that, that's going to rule it uh, at this stage. This is very similar to a slide that Bruce put up, so I'm not going to talk about it uh, in too much detail. Uh, th there are some, th there are other connectivity standards. Uh, so just to be clear, you know, there are other options. Um, I think the main difference between what I would call a cellular connectivity standard and some of these non-cellular, let's call them non-cellular standards. So Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi works at 2.4 gigahertz. Sigfox, LoRa, uh, these typically work around 868, 915 megahertz, so lower frequency. Bluetooth we've mentioned. Uh, the, the big difference between the cellular standards and the non-cellular standards is that the cellular network operators have paid a lot of money for their spectrum, and they are very protective of it, very, as, and rightly so. So when you're using a cellular system, you've got protected spectrum with nothing in there. It's, it's great real estate. This is your beachfront real estate that the network operators have paid an awful lot of money for. If you're using a non-cellular standard, you're using in regulatory ITU speak, you're using a short-range device. 
And these operate in the industrial, scientific, or medical frequency ranges. These are the typical frequency ranges. You have some around uh, 433, 868 megs in Europe. Varies a little bit across the, uh, across the globe, sort of the cellular ones. 2.4 gigs is pretty standard. But these are completely unprotected frequencies. This is your bad neighborhood. You share this with really nasty neighbors, like microwave ovens and, oh God, Bluetooth again, Wi-Fi. There's no protection. If, um, if, 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 if someone starts jamming Vodafone's 900 meg spectrum, they will be talking to Binitzar or Ofcom or wherever. Hey. I've got an interferer in my spectrum, do something about it. If you're using 868 megs or 2.4 gigs, you have, to, you have no protection from any interference, uh, and you can't cause any interference, but nor do you have protection from it. You just use it, it's a bad neighborhood, you take what's there. So if you want secure data, secure operation, you've got much more safety in the cellular networks because the network operators have a strong vested interest in keeping that spectrum protected. So th th that's just a, just a little bit on some of the other bands as well. I mean, uh, that's not to say that there's anything wrong with these. You know, Bluetooth is fine. Uh, if, 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 uh, if my Bluetooth connection only works 10 meters instead of 20 meters, it's okay, I can live with it. You know, I'll, you know, by the time I've gone, it'll change. There are times where that's good. But if you want reliable communication, global coverage, you want a secure connection as well. So in terms of practical implementations then, what does this mean? Uh, 2G still has by far the best global coverage. Today, if you want a solution today, 2G will give you global coverage. Other standards, well, 3G is pretty good, 4G is getting there, but 2G still far outpaces it. Uh, the operators want to close the 2G networks, simply because they want to use that spectrum for 4G, for wider bandwidth, high paying data. But they don't want to close the networks if they're going to lose customers because the 4G networks aren't ready. We're in that situation today. So I think 2G will still be around for, 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 for many years. It'll vary from region to region and country to country, but the, the, the demise of 2G, I think, is still a fair way off. I don't think that's the case for 3G. Uh, it looks to me, and I'll openly admit this is a personal opinion, and if an operator disagrees with me, please do so, uh, but it looks to me like the 3G networks are going to close down faster because the 3G networks can be rapidly deployed to 4G and no one will notice. Uh, and they, then they could, that's 3G spectrum, they can put higher data rate 4G in. So I think we're going to see the demise of the 3G networks long before we see the demise of the 2G networks, and they'll just be rolled into 4G. And 5G... Again, Bruce mentioned that uh, 5G, all, all the 4G standards are included in 5G. So I've had, I've had a few questions over various things saying, oh my God, we've gone through 2G to 3G. From a radio perspective, this was horrible. Everything changed. And then did it again with 4G. More bands, different modulation schemes. And have we got all this again with 5G? I, you know, I think no, like the way Bluetooth now just works where it never used to. All the 4G standards are included within 5G. So you will not notice the transition to 5G on your phone other than you might get faster data rate. Uh, but otherwise, it's going to be actually be very similar. So the, if you like, 5G is a superset of, uh, of 4G. And the current 4G standards will all be included within that. So I think the, the industry is starting to learn its lesson. Um, there are some roaming agreement issues. Uh, Bruce mentioned that in more depth than I, I, I intend to cover. They need to be in place. That has to happen. 2G is still by far the lowest cost solution today. If you want something out now, 2G is the right way to do it. But you have to consider the future and how do we future-proof it. Uh, so long-term, CAT M1 or NBI and or NBIOT, this is, the, this is definitely the long-term solution. Ten years from now, that's what will be happening. For the interim, we're looking at CAT M1, NBIOT, or CAT M1 and or NBIOT, but having 2G fallback. So we can do that as an interim solution. What kind of products are available, or how do you do it? RF again, how do we make this, how, 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 do, we, how do we make this all into a practical part? I don't know, the, um, maybe some of you have seen this thing stream button. This is, 
I carry this around with me because it's a, it's a lovely demonstration when we were talking uh, first thing this morning about how do we make things simple. This, is a, this to me is a lovely simple implementation. Uh, this is a 2G button. You press a button and it sends me an email. That's all it does. But it works anywhere. I've traveled all over the place with this. Uh, and it's got a simple 2G modem inside it. Uh, the, that SIMCOM, it's a SIM 800, I think, in here. But single, two-layer, FR4, printed circuit board. Really simple antenna. I made a little quip about uh, wanting it to work off an AA battery uh, as well. So put, 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 put my money where my mouth is. It's an AA battery size. <laughs> it's not an AA battery because it's 3.6 volts. But the point is, is we're getting there. That will give you, it even works. That just went out to the ThingStream network, by the way, when it beeped then. Uh, that will give you global coverage in some hardware, which is not going to cost much more than 10, 15 euro, and it will run off an AA sized battery. I charge this up about once every six months. It's, uh, it's low cost, it's small, it's simple, and it works. What was difficult about the RF in there? A bit of wire with the antenna on it. Everything else is in the module. So the RF side doesn't have to be difficult. The hardware semiconductor manufacturers are actually making the RF side of it very easy because you just buy the module. I have a Bluetooth one as well. Yeah, I love Bluetooth. You might, you, might have, uh, you might have learned that. But this is a Bluetooth. This is even simpler. So things are getting very, very simple now. Okay, this is short range. This will work in this room. Maybe the next one if the wind's blowing in the right direction. But you, you, can, make it, you can make it simple. It doesn't have to be complicated anymore. And I think that's the message. We've got a modem. This has an external antenna connector. Uh, dual band modem. It's even got, uh, th this one here even has a, a GPS receiver, GNSS receiver for precision location. You can get network location if you don't need uh, location better than a couple of hundred meters. You don't even need a GNSS receiver. You can use the network location system to tell you where it is. Uh, when, when that beeped at me, the email that I'll get, it will tell me where I was. I'm sure it'll show me I was in the, you know, somewhere near the center of Amsterdam, so it's, it can be quite good. One of our suppliers is SimCom. SimCom has a huge range of different modules. Um, I'll add this to the test on the 5G bands. But if you want, you know, if you want 2G or 3G, regional coverage, global coverage, depending on the data rate, there's a huge array of uh, devices available now. Uh, obviously, higher data rate, more bands, it's going to get bigger and it's going to get more expensive. But there's a big range of products now. And all the RF is inside here. All you have to do on that is connect it to the antenna. There's no RF or hardware design required. Um, the other thing for making things future-proof uh, and from a hardware perspective is it'd be kind of nice if you didn't have to keep relaying out the board when you move from a 2G to a 4G solution. And the hardware manufacturers are doing this. So in the, uh, in, you know, in the same sized module, this is a 17 by 15 module, uh, these are all available today. This is not future stuff. You can buy these today. You can have a 2G only modem. You can have a 2G with GNSS. You can have a 4G CAT NB IoT with, for global coverage, or M1 NB IoT, and they're all in the same footprint. Uh, you could almost use exactly the same layout. Sometimes you've got, you might have different frequency or something, but it's basically footprint. Sim, uh, foot, footprint similar, as close as could possibly be, so that you can just upgrade the design as, uh, as, as technology progresses, or indeed if you want to use, if you have different regional variations, you could do the same thing. So the hardware manufacturers are making it simple. Um, this is a, uh, uh, yeah, th 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 this is a good example of something, uh, this is quite popular at the moment, it's an interim solution where Yes, I want 4G, I want it to be future-proof, but hey, I want it to work right now everywhere in the world as well. So this is a, this is a CAT M1 NB IoT modem, but it has 2G fallback. So it will do everything today and five, 10 years from now. So there are solutions. It's slightly more complex because it needs an extra radio in it, but it's not dramatically more complex. It's, this is in a 24 by 24 mil package, and that will give you everything today. Um, I'm going to skip this because it's uh, really, I think, uh, the, 
a Samsung or an iPhone buys the ICs. I don't think anyone doing IoT would seriously consider buying a chipset from them and designing the entire radio around it. If you are thinking about that, don't. Buy a module. <laughs> It'll save you a whole lot of grief. <laughs> and the final thing, just in the last couple of minutes, is the antenna. And I think I, I've seen a lot of implementations of RF where the antenna is kind of tacked on as an afterthought. The antenna is the single most important thing, part of the radio. Uh, again, you know, there are different solutions. We can use external antennas. You can even use a bit of PCB board. You can put the antenna trace down on a printed circuit board. Uh, you can get ceramic. You can buy ceramic chipsets. Tau glass is, uh, is one of our antenna suppliers. And I think you've even, you've even got an LTE uh, 2G antenna in the, uh, in, in the goodie bag from Tau glass. Uh, that's a, a kind of a right angled one. Anten antennas can be internal or external. Internal's nice because it keeps them out of the way, but they don't work as well. External antennas are much, much better give much better performance. I, I think the real message is just don't skimp on it. Use the best antenna you can afford that will fit in the space you have available. It's, it's very easy to say, you know, I can say, ah, great. You know, if I, I'm sure, I'm sure if, I cut the, I, if I cut the antenna off there and just left the wire, if there was a base station on the building up there and I pressed the button, it would still work. But it's not going to work very well as soon as you get away from the city. Um, it's also the base station is going to say, oh, God, that was a really weak signal. It's going to send a message back to the radio. Turn up your transmitter power. I can't hear you. That's effectively what we do. Well, what that does is drain your battery faster. So don't be fooled into thinking just because it works, it's efficient. If you have a poor antenna, you will greatly increase the current consumption of your device because it's winding up the transmitter power to try and compensate for a lousy antenna. So don't, don't compromise on the antenna. I think that's the, uh, that, that's the, that, that's the main message there. Uh, some different antenna solutions. Uh, uh, these, I think you, you have something like this in the goodie bag. But external antennas work better, cost more. Printed circuit board antennas fit nicely on the printed circuit board. Uh, save space, give you a nice internal solution. Don't put it in a metal box. <laughs> Won't work if you put it in a metal box. You've got to think about things like that. Uh, but there are, there are various antenna solutions. There's also a lot of advice available. I mean, at the end of the day, EBV, what we want to do, we, we, we sell components. So you know, we'll, provide, we'll provide advice on modem selection, antenna selection, uh, et cetera. And we work very closely with our suppliers to do that. That was the commercial. Uh, so just in, uh, 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 just in the last couple of minutes, quick summary. Um, I think where we are now is it's 2G today, gives you the global coverage. There's a clear migration path to 4G and 5G for low power IoT standards. There are hardware solutions available today. Uh, you know, don't think, oh, I've got to wait for the right thing to come out. All these solutions are available right now today. So don't, you know, you can, you can design products now with confidence. You don't have to redesign them in five years' time. Not because of the RF, anyway. Uh, 2G, 4G combination products will give you the migration path. Don't compromise the antenna. Uh, eventually, the low power 4G standards are going to give us the lowest. The, it, the, the, the Nirvana is the low power 4G standards because this will give us low cost, low complexity, and low power con consumption. And that's where we want to get to. And from an RF perspective, no, RF is not difficult. RF is quite simple. I liked your Einstein quote. Keep it simple. Keep the RF simple. It will keep the costs down. You'll get the design faster to market as well if it's simpler. That's always the way. That was all I had. Uh, I hope it was instructive. I hope I've demystified some of the RF at least. Uh, so, ah, questions. I'm used to people shouting at me. <laughs> With an IoT product life expectancy of five years, do you believe it's safe to keep a product with just 2G connectivity only? I think the answer to that is it depends on the, it depends where you want it to operate. So some countries have already switched off 2G. So in those countries, the answer is no. Uh, if you're looking for a global solution in most countries, yes. I think, where are we? We were 2019, uh, two, so five years is 2024. 
how many, how many 2G networks are going to be operating in 2024? I think quite a few, but I also think some of them will have been switched off. So I think you have to, to answer the question exactly, I think you would have to look very carefully at the countries you wanted to operate in and maybe discuss with those operators. Uh, and what I would do is I would look for a 4G solution with the 2G fallback because then you don't have to worry about it. Uh, is range frequency detuned by the battery? Uh, yes, it can be. Uh, the, uh, if the, if the, this, is, this is quite a good example, actually. Um, the battery, the antenna, sits alongside the battery. Is that battery detuning the antenna? It's not affecting the frequency. It's not going to change the frequency. But it could detune the antenna. The, the antenna like that is probably more efficient than it is lying alongside the battery. But this is quite a small device, and at the end of the day, it's a compromise. Uh, to a certain extent, you can design for it. You can tune the antenna so that it's resonant when it's next to the battery, and that will work. This does work. It seems to work quite well. So the answer is yes. The physical environment around the antenna will detune it, and you do need to consider it. You want to get the antenna really as high and as in the clear as possible, but it's always a compromise. That's the, uh, uh, any, any engineering development is a compromise, and RF even more so. I knew I wouldn't get off this stage without having to talk about Brexit. If the UK leave the EU, will 4G still work? <laughs> I, I, su I suggest you ask Boris Johnson. <laughs> uh, is, there any, is there any chipset which will work on all, network? uh, all networks? Yes, yes. I mean, most of the chipsets will work on most networks. Uh, that's the intention of them. Uh, the, chip, chip, the chipsets inside these modems are designed to work across all the frequency bands available. So I think always a guarded yes, but yes. Are there any other non-technological questions? <laughs> I think I ran, no, no, about two minutes over. All right, thank you very much.